Michael, who usually organizes the meetup, is not here today. He's in somewhere in Asia. So uh, I'll just kick it off by starting the meetup. Um, I think it's very exciting to see a bunch of people here. This past few weeks um, has felt like years in the blockchain space, or specifically Ethereum. And so it's very exciting. And, uh, I keep hearing new, like seeing new people and like, getting excited about all the new possibilities, new developers joining, starting new different things. Um, and that way it's very exciting. Um, I'm, I'm from Cape Town in South Africa, and being here, giving a talk here is very exciting. So um, I hope I get to share some of the things that I've been busy with. So uh, the topic for the day that I'm going to do is something that I call curation markets. The other word for it initially was meme markets, but I felt people misinterpreted what it's supposed to be. But memes is a part of the idea. And the subtitle is Through Forests of Dogecoins and Decentralized Bands. And I thought I'd do this talk right at the end. I'll give you an example of what creation markets are and how it works. But I thought it interesting to explain how I got to much of these, this thinking. And I've been thinking about these problems for quite a while. And it started around 2013 um, at that point in time. So by the end of it, you'll see things like describing things where, say, the potential for each subreddit or community having a token the ability to monetize almost every open source project, weird things like decentralized bands, and then right at the end, things like uh, internet meme markets, such as uh, reinventing things like rare Pepe cards. Uh, I'm not sure how many people know about that, but I'll, I'll, I'll explain later some of the, some of the different concepts. Um, so about me, uh, I found Bitcoin in 2011. Uh, this was when the, the Java Bitcoin library was first launched. Um, the media picked it up by saying, Google is getting into the blockchain uh, Bitcoin space, but it was because Mike Hearn was a developer at Google who launched the thing, right? So it was just like a developer there. Um, like many in the space at that point in time, uh, being a computer scientist, I found this very fascinating. And, and I went down a rabbit hole like many of us and spent two weeks looking at the thing and realizing this is not supposed to work. And then you find, go through the code, you go through white paper, and you're realizing this is actually working and it's very surprising. And it was an amazing, amazing thing to realize that there's definitely something here. And at that point in time, I finished my master's degree in social informatics at the end of 2013. And I just kept looking at Bitcoin and keeping an eye on it. Um, like many of us, we all have tales of not buying enough at the right time. Um, and that happened. It was a, a, being at university, a bunch of friends, we pulled some money together. To, to, I think Bitcoin was about two, two or four dollars. And we put a bunch of money together, we put it on some exchange. We're getting money from South Africa to these exchanges were very weird at that point in time. And um, we kept putting the buy orders such that it, we hoped it would get filled. And it was like, ah, it didn't happen. And then at that point, you start trading off like, do you want money to party with? Or do you want to <laughs> And so, made the wrong, <laughs> made, a, made a mistake there by choosing to party. Um, and so I finished my master's degree in social informatics, but the important thing here is that I did research in information overload, which is how people cope with dealing with too much information on social media sites. And that's important for later because I eventually incorporated much of this research into some of these designs. Um, but during that time when Bitcoin didn't die and it kept being around, I decided there's definitely something here. I need to check back in. And so I became a Bitcoin developer in 2013. I started building a startup using Bitcoin. Um, and then later on, I got deeper into the code. I um, started doing work on payment channels in Bitcoin. Uh, it was a project where you could, you could download a file and would pay per increment of the file being downloaded, as an example. Um, but at that, that time, it, 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 it was still, you know, working with these code bases were very difficult. And then, at the end of 2013, one of the most interesting things happened that Cass sent down like a cascade of thoughts that I still haven't managed to like release, like I still think about it every day, is Dogecoin, right? Mm -hmm. Dogecoin was this, this altcoin that was launched as cryptocurrency, its whole purpose was just to be, there is a funny dog, and that's the currency. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting about it was that um, it wasn't a cryptocurrency that had any technical, new technical things, right? It was just like, there's, we didn't improve the hashing algorithm, we didn't improve anything else. We just decided we're going to make a currency and it's going to be such wow, much money. You know, it's just going to be this funny thing. And it picked up and it just people started using it. And surprisingly, even now, it's still around. And apparently, it's almost like a billion dollar 
market cap <laughs> in, the current, in the current climate. So this is really fascinating, and seeing people using it. And I got, it got me thinking, like, like had this weird realization that does it mean that money itself or the value that we ascribe to something could simply be related to sort of a memes network effect, like how many people care about something. And so I wrote a blog post at the end of 2013, and I thought about what if you could extrapolate it to people, like what if we could have currencies for every person. And I said, with Dogecoin, however, there's no theme or other concept besides Doge, the meme, and it's currently very, very big on, on the net. And Doge, Doge harnesses a strong networking effect, and its usefulness as a currency is just that, right? So people used it as this funny thing to connect with other people, and they did things like raising money to get a bobsled team to the Olympics. They got a car into NASCAR. It's a, it's it was it was one of the most fun things to watch on the net, and still think one of the most interesting things that have happened. And so I got stuck in this idea of um, everyone will have their own currency. I got stuck in that idea, so I tried to keep exploring that thing. And so obviously, being a programmer and having this code code base out there, I did the most next logical thing, which is, um, so the question was, can a network effect stand an altcoin? The coin represents that in-group, and that's why Dogecoin succeeds, right? And that is the hypothesis I wanted to test. Because I got stuck in this idea of there being personal currencies, I decided, wouldn't it be great to launch a Simon coin, right? <laughs> that's the next logical thing, right? Um, and the plan was to just roll with it, but unfortunately, um, when I launched it, I said, in the far future, I hope, if this idea takes off, creating a system where buying another person's coins could be simple as walking past them, right? <laughs> and so there you will off all these network effects trading against each other. But I realized, uh, I don't think it makes sense. There's too many things here that, like awkward incentives, like who will be the miners? Why do they need to get the coin? Like there's some stuff that doesn't make sense. So I went back to the drawing board and thought, Okay, um, what else can we do that, make, that I can do where I can launch an altcoin like this and experiment with those hypotheses? Um, and at that point in time, the only thing available was just launching your own altcoin. We don't have Ethereum now where you know, the developer can click deploy a ERC20 token uh, today. Like, there was nothing available besides doing your own thing, forking the code, spending three weeks looking at it. So I tried to go back and think about it, and I did went through this weird detour where I tried to figure out how to do decentralized altcoins and Bitcoin. Uh, people thought it was a dumb idea, uh, so I scrapped that and realized it's too complicated. I need something that also has a strong network effect, like Dogecoin, to try this. Um, and so, some, so something else happened at that point in time, which is quite interesting. Um, there is a band in South Africa, so yeah, for South Africa. Uh, called Folk Politica, right? And they're an Afrikaans punk rock band, they're very big. And then someone did a sketch comedy, which was very interesting. So Folk Politica is from Cape Town. That's where their home base is. There was another group that just simply pretended to be the same band, but from a different city. Like, they said, we're Folk of Politica from Pretoria. Like, they literally pretended to be the band. And they did this funny sketch show where they would rock up and say, like, we are the band. And I thought that was interesting potential to scale music. Like, what if everyone could just be the same band? We could just scale music like that and play shows in different parts of the world without the actual same band members having to be in the same spots. So, <laughs> so I thought, you know what? Decentralized band. Decentralized currency. Why don't we put this together? And so the cypherpunks was born. <laughs> Not the cypherpunks, which is the group of early cryptographers, but the cypherpunks. And so that, that was the project I started uh, trying to experiment with, with that. Um, did it succeed? Um, so the question with, with, with that was, can an old coin represent a decentralized band? Uh, this coin represents the in-group in of this collective, just like Dogecoin represents the in-group of that specific group. And it's like a game, a focal point game, trying to work together in that regard. So did it work? In some ways it did. Um, more than 100 songs were produced by more than 20 artists across the world. People remix things from each other, and all, all the artists release songs as the cypherpunks, like even if you were a different person doing the work. And some of the songs were mildly successful. Um, the highest success goal I set for myself was, could this thing allow one musician, musician to make a living from this? And I don't think we got there, but I learned a lot through this process. Some other weird things happened as well, 
um, the South African news picked it up and um, <laughs> decided to interview me. <laughs> and the cool thing about it is it's just, I got the same line where I'm fine virtual currency. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, during the interview, they kept asking me about, oh, what about the drugs and mine, blah, 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 blah. It's like, that's not the point. And they kept saying it's, about, it's South Africa's first virtual currency. That was not the point at all, but it was, it was fun to be on TV and trying to, to, to tell people what decentralized bands are or like the digital currencies in general. Um, and it's still alive. Uh, I haven't touched the, the code in three years, but people are still buying it. And this is not also during the recent uh, price rise, people started buying it again. Um, which made me realize I probably need to go find my old keys, because it is somewhere. Uh, I have a bunch. Um, so, you know, people, th th I think that the, one of the lessons here is that blockchains are extremely resilient. Like, you might think it died, but it didn't. Um, <laughs> uh, so, it, it's still around. So, the thing about it was interesting, I learned a lot. Um, the lightning incentives are very hard. Um, trying to figure out how to get this group of people to work together. Because on the one side, you had the miners who were being paid out for this. And why are they getting some of the coins? Couldn't you just give it to new artists that join? That's one of the things. Um, and one thing is the Bitcoin code base sucks. It's really hard. And it didn't make anything easier um, to work with, trying to fork and work with it. And so the rest of 2014, after that project, I did some other stuff in the space, trying to do different things. One was a project called Cheers, which would allow it to easily tip any musician. Uh, this got some news, like Fred Durst for some reason, from Limbiscuit contacting us. <laughs> oh, this um, Mojo was something else would allow any Twitter user to mint their own personal tokens. That was going to be built on Doge Party, which is the counterparty clone on Dogecoin. Um, you see, like that time, this was the only things that were available, really. Uh, but unfortunately, both projects kind of derailed for various reasons. And then my money started running out. I, <laughs> I managed to spend 2014 working on these weird things because I saved, I saved my money in Dogecoin and my Dogecoin savings were running out. Um, and so, at that point in time, I thought, you know, bumping my head into the ceiling with all these different projects, there needs to be something better out there, and luckily something came around, and Ethereum was then just, it, it was announced, the sale was, was, was done, and they started hiring people. So I thought, maybe I should just, you know, join Ethereum project itself. I am a developer, I got stuck with these problems, let's help more people do these experiments, because it shouldn't take, a computer science graduate a month to deploy something like this. Like, it's hard work and we need to do it more, more of it more faster. And so I asked for jobs at the Ethereum Foundation, but then consensus found me and I became employee number six in January 2015. Um, I joined mainly to work on tokens and token designs and music. And I'm still working on token designs and music. So it's been an exciting time. And so the two and a half, past two and a half years, um, it's been a bit of a blur. Um, and during that time, I've done a lot of research. I came back to the original question is, how we can create these networks of value where different memes and different ideas, weird things like decentralized bands, people, maybe even cities, like different things could have their own tokenized value attached to it. And so I did a bunch of research and kept asking that question. And so I wrote a bunch of stuff during that time. And one of the main reasons why I kept thinking about it is because automation is coming. Like, we need more different economic tools so we can work together in the current society. We're going to lose more and more jobs. What is the world going to look like? If we don't invent these new systems, ways to earn a living, then we're, this society is going to crumble or get worse. So how do you allow more memes and networks to have an associated tokenized value without there being a centralized party involved? That would remain the top question for me. So I wrote a bunch of stuff. Um, things like this one was about increasing novelty in online spaces. This came from my master's research where I just basically said, hey, like, when a when thousand people discuss an IRC channel, it's a mess. Uh, you can't have a quality conversation when there's a thousand people in a, in a chat, chat room. So maybe you can do some sort of way to, t to, to introduce some fees there to make sure that people can keep a conversation going. Um, other things was, this is a paper I submitted to the Hong Kong work blockchain workshops. Similar idea, maybe we could introduce some fees um, as the conversation, as more conversations happen to make sure people can keep, keep a conversation going. Um, this was 
very interesting one. I think it was a very kickbaity headline, but the, it, it worked. <laughs> People read, read it a lot, which is a concept called organizations, organizations that create themselves. So it came from different angles, like one which is how do we build these systems so that we can build novel, novel conversations, but also how do you mint these tokens? Like who gets to decide where these come from? Should it be a person or a specific institution? And this blog post was the first time I had this concept of it's simply you set up the rules and if you agree to the rules, these tokens are minted. So um, this idea where we can create an organization automatically and it happens just because if you have these rules there, people can coordinate around these specific rules. Um, that sounds pretty vague, but I'll, I'll, it, gets, it gets more in-depth later, more detailed. Um, and then probably my favorite one was I eventually combined these two, two ideas together. Uh, in, in the DEFCON 2, here in DEFCON 2, I had a conversation with Machel Pinsky. He's um, one of my favorite people in the space, also thinking a lot about the same kind of things. Um, where I eventually combined the two, and that's when I called the idea hashtag markets. So the concept is, um, when you want to coordinate around common goals, ideally you don't want existence to be reliable and single entity. And my thinking is that there's a lot of people that think about like we should solve problem X, but the only way you can get to solving problem X is to do things like creating an organization in a specific jurisdiction. But what if these, what are these, what if these people are in different countries? What if these people are in different parts of the world? You need to submit like the documentation. It's hard. What if you just have the intent? And tomorrow, this organization can exist in a global manner. Like that was one of the the, the questions that I wanted to raise and start thinking towards. Uh, then there's a blog post about like whether your application needs a token, um, and that came down to the concept of where tokens are useful to coordinate people around a specific solution versus other solutions. So it was basically that um, this came back from research by Nick Zabo a brilliant, brilliant thinker where he basically describes that collectibles, like shells, were the first forms of money because these collectibles represented my affiliation towards the other people in my tribe. So hard to collect tokens in tribes represent an in-group and thus reduces the cost of coordinating. Another good example of this is a ticket to an event, right? If, you, if there's a cost to get into the event, then you know that the people are, that are there, you'll have, you'll be able to have a good conversation with because there was this barrier to entry to get in, right? Um, so there's this concept, it, it eventually evolved, and then I found other research from different disciplines um, uh, called use stress, which is beneficial stress, which is quite interesting. Um, it's a concept where systems respond favorably to systemic stress, and we see this everywhere. Things like in toxicology, you have methanodactism, which is you inject toxins into a system to improve its immune system, right? These concepts are, are relatively known in different systems, but we haven't seen this really applied to systems, social systems design. Um, so I thought about the concept of going back to the thing about where fees are introduced dynamically towards conversations. It's like we can invent an algorithm that ultimately fosters coordination through introducing stressors at optimal times. And yeah, this is this is like I'm getting too deep into these different things, but there's a <laughs> there's a bunch of blog posts and things. That I'll, I'll put the slides up as well. But one one continuous token models, which is sort of thinking about how these tokens are minted, which is a core component of curation markets. Uh, yeah, this is the concept of use stress, which is you inject something into the system, it stimulates, but if you inject too much of it, there is a inhibition. Um, and then probably one of my favorite articles, which was uh, touching upon these things, where I did some research about how organizations changed and where I think uh, where organizations are going to go. The topic is called Jack and the Giant Joint Stock Pepe. Um, and the concept is that these blockchain tokens form kind of new tribes of coordination around various ideas. And because you lower the barrier to entry to do that substantially over any other form of organizational structure that have existed before, we're going to see some weird things like people building organizations around memes such as like Pepe memes, right? Because rare Pepe cards are one of the things that are growing as, 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 as something. It's, it's a hilarious thing. It's just people think it's a, it, it is a joke, but <laughs> I think it's, a, it's, it's something to pay attention to um, in, in the way organizations structure themselves. Um, and there's, there's no specific institution or entity that builds these organizations. Uh, and then finally I came to 
the final iteration, which I want to share more today about how it works from a technical perspective, which is the concept of curation markets that combine all these things from different areas and put it just into one protocol that um, is, I've been learning a lot about how to describe it, and I don't think I've done the best job so far um, about how this works, but I keep improving. Um, so sharing this today, hopefully you guys come back to me and tell me that didn't make sense, but then I read the white paper and you could have done that better. Right. So, if you think I, if you think that will help, please, please get in touch with me. So the goal is said to go back to the regional drawing board, which is allowing each topic, meme, idea, or goal to have an associated token of value to it, and it's useful there because it helps you curate information with that token. Um, and that means we'll be able to mint tokens for subreddits, hashtag peoples, memes, and millions of new kinds of organizations. And thus, curation markets was born. And we call to have some 80s music there. <laughs> yeah. um, so creation was born, and uh, I, I, the next few slides just like giving, giving, gives a description about how this works from a very top-down level, and then um, gives also a specific example using a specific community. So these are the, the different parts about how, how it works. Okay, the first one is that a specific token can be minted at any time meaning there's no time limit to creating these tokens, but it's set to a price set by a specific smart contract. That's the point where it says an algorithm decides what the price is, right? The price of the token gets more expensive as more people buy in, right? It's the concept of the ticket to an event gets more expensive the more people you expect to come, right? So the price gets more expensive. The amount that was paid isn't going to someone specifically. It's kept, it just kept in a communal deposit, sort of collateralized the token. And at any point in time, a token can be taken out or burned, as the, they use the, the, the parlance they use in this space, from the supply, and you can take some money out with you from this deposit. And then the tokens internally are used to bond to curators for subtopics, who then curate information cited with their proportional backing. Right? So if I believe person A is a good curator, I'm going to bond my tokens with them. And their goal is to curate information with this tokenized signal, the skin in the game. And if they do a good job, it will attract more attention, increasing the ticket price to get in, to work together, to coordinate together. And there's different parts here that's important. If you just take this, right, then it sounds sort of like, kind of like semi-pyramid scheme-ish setup, where you incentivize people to come in after you, because that's where you make benefit. But the important thing is that this hopefully works because of the, the core benefit, which is tokens are um, signals to what you're interested in, right? So tokens are your sort of affiliation. It's like the way likes are used from Facebook on Tinder, right? In the sense of your affiliation, all the different tokens you have represent who you are. And that's why people, Dogecoin had none of this curation stuff, but people still bought Dogecoin because they were wanted to be involved in this community. And having this Dogecoin was the signal that you had skin in the game in the community. You were involved with that group of people. So I decided to give like a more clear example of, of what this actually would look like in practice. So I decided to take a look at the ETH Trader community. So the ETH Trader community is a subreddit which um, um, on, 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 on Reddit, which talks about how you trade Ethereum and its various tokens, like what's good market strategies, maybe share some news, maybe share some funny picks and so forth. But for this example, they, they think the community wants to get around to curate good technical analysis of these charts, of these like, prices and things. And so it starts off by there being no tokens in the supply, and for just this explanation, the, the sort of the algorithm that decides the price I made is very simple, very digestible, but in practice it's a bit more complicated. So you start off by saying there's zero tokens in the supply, it costs one Ether per token. And you say, I want to be part of this community, I want an ETH trader token. So person A buys one token, there's now one token in the supply overall, and the new cost could went up. There's now, for a new person to get in, it would cost two Ether. And then in this communal pool, there's one Ether. So that just stays there. Person B comes and say, hey, I think you're on something here. I want to be a part of this community. I also buy a token. Now there's two tokens in supply. The price went up for the next person to come in, and the pool went got larger. Same for person C. 
Same thing goes on. This is the, the state of the, the curation market. And then person A decides, hang on, I, I want another token. I want two tokens. So overall now, the cost would be five ether per token to get in. And in the pool there, there's 10 ether. Now comes the interesting part where people actually use these tokens. Now they want to decide, hang on, we want to figure out what's good technical analysis and we want to add tokenized skin in the game through those signals, not just sharing it. To put it in there, you need to be able to stake these tokens to specific curators. Person A thinks, I'm a good curator, I know what I'm doing, I'm going to stake the tokens myself, and the subtopic is PA, which is technical analysis. Person B does the same, and overall in the subtopic there are now three staked tokens. So three out of the, the four supply is now staked into the specific subtopic. And then what they do is they now go and use that backing that they have, these specific curators, and they curate information. It's like a normal upvote or a like, right? It's the same kind of action. And so you would, these signals that we generate would be something like person A and person B backs the, backs the specific technical analysis that says Ether is going to go to $1,000, um, which means everyone likes that idea. So <laughs> Person A backs, but only backs technical analysis too, which means it's only 66% of the people upvoted that. Person B backs 33%. And no one backs TA4 because it says the price will go this year. Um, <laughs> so in this way, the community tries to curate good information and good signals. And if they're successful with this, then people would, they would start attracting attention to this group doing good technical analysis. And does someone else want to come in because one, they want to be a part of this, and two, they think they can do a better job. So hopefully then you, you get this group to coordinate around this specific topic. Now you can start doing things as well with a specific token. It doesn't have to be technical analysis. Group communication isn't just about figuring out what's best for the group. We share inside jokes, so maybe they share funny, funny memes in this topic. Maybe they share news as well. Right? So it can be staked to different subtopics. And through this, it helps to add skin in the game to produce novel information. Um, new users who want to participate in the in-group can come in and help coordinate. And then good signals get attention, more coordination happens, more wants to get in. And the feed, this feedback loop keeps going until there's a marginal return to the value of the coordination being generated. And this is going to happen at some point. And so person A decides, you know what, I'm not getting any value here anymore, I'm leaving. And so what they do is, they take their two tokens, which is two out of four of them, they pay the total of five ether for those tokens. There's five ether in the pool, because they have 50% of this, they can just take the five out with them, which means at this point they broke even, but it could be a profit or a loss. And the total supply is now back to two, which means the important part here is the algorithm adjusted and the price went down again to get it. Right? So this token, the value token grows and shrinks as the community and the interest in the specific meme or topic grows and shrinks. Um, so that was a quick crash course on what that would look like in general. But the concept is very generic because I think it can be applied for many, 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 many different things besides something like this. And it's really open to a lot of different ways. Which You only think about, do we want to coordinate and curate around something where we don't think we need a traditional corporation? We don't need different things um, we want to have the ability to produce more novel information when there's a critical mass of conversation. So you can do things like, what about monetizing open source projects? You curate on what pull requests should be, be merged. You think about what features should be added to a new project. What about Ethereum standards? Like, should we adopt this standard or not, right? What about different subreddits? What about curating funny information? Doge, we do Doge there. What about your realm that you're with in World of Warcraft. What about different Bitcoin subreddits when people want to um, not agree with each other anymore? Um, what about music discovery? Uh, genre discovery, dubstep, techno, rock, whatever your favorite genre is. What about people? Uh, I want Vitalik to pay attention to what conferences he should go to. I think he should uh, check out this research. Uh, I think I want his advice, so I'm going to curate that information so that he pays attention to that. So there's a lot of different ways you could this, this could be reused. Coming back to the decentralized band project, which I really want to redo at some point, <laughs> right? Because I think the economics are better. What about curating different releases? What about standards? What about where different gigs are being played, right? What about art? Vaporwave or glitch art? You know, there's many different things here. 
and coming back to the, the rare Pepe cards. The rare Pepe system has like this foundation where they verify the cards. But you can do this through this system where the community verifies the cards. They think what is the funniest ones or the best ones, right? What about virtual worlds? What about coordinating a decentralized virtual world where people can, people can decide what needs to be at specific coordinates? What about things like this virtual world as kings? Who gets to be the king? What's to be the next expansion? What if you can co-create what the canon of the virtual world is? Everyone can write canon and people vote or curate what's the best canon of the world. And doing this whole process, it's not as if any of this can be done in general, but the cool thing about this is if this works, then everyone can actually earn value from doing this. Like, they're not doing it just in their free time. A lot of people, a lot of people do this in altruistic reasons, right? We want to connect, we want to collaborate, but now they can actually earn from doing this. Um, and the protocol has different extensions. There are things like um, the possibility to use different cost curves. I think that will that will matter for different kind of projects. Um, you can do things like batch auctions in there. You can even do initial token launches to bootstrap some of these markets. Probably the most important one is the ability to add beneficiaries. So in this process where you're buying and selling the, this token, you can have a beneficiary which is receive some portion of the fees. And in that way, you can actually fund the startup through a curation market. Um, but that introduces new legal issues where you don't have to consider if you're actually minting a security or not. Um, and then finally, it will be extended to allow, not just like you have Ether and you buy a token, but what about other tokens you can use, or even things like reputation as a cost to get in, or you can even recreate Bitcoin with a model like this using proof of work. So there's different extensions here. And the cool thing is, two weeks ago, I put up the first code. So it's, uh, it's available at consensus forward slash curation markets. And so the first code is just the smart contracts, and it has just the most generic version of it, which is the ability to mint these tokens for any topic that you want. You can copy the code, deploy it, any topic, and then it allows you to bond it to curators and then vote on information. There's no front end yet, so it's very just like developer bare bones stuff. I want people to come look at the code. There's been people that have done some bug fixes up there, but this specific project is still only about 30% of my time. I'm, I'm still mostly working on Uja, which is a music, music platform. Um, so I'm putting this out there because I want people to, to experiment with this um, and see if this, these economics work, because it's still an open-ended question. So, the great thing is we're, we have something like Ethereum available where we can just put it out there and make it easier for people to, do, to start experimenting with this. So please go to Consensus Creation Markets if you're a developer and um, please go test it out and fork it and give me feedback. Um, uh, I've, a lot of people have come to me and given me various feedback from the protocol level design to like ideas they have for this. So it's very exciting and I think it's a very interesting progression, you know, coming back from the day in 2013 when Dogecoin first arrived and I thought there's something here, to get in here a few years later, I think we're on the right path. Um, and I hope to see a future where we can build these new networks of value. I think it will allow a lot of people to have new kinds of agency and be empowered in new ways. And that's curation markets with an exclamation mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. That's it. Anyone have any questions? Yeah. So, for the way that you have the payment structure set up, um, or rather the, the way that people join one of these curation markets, uh, it it seems to favor right, the early adopters, right, the people who find out about it first. Yeah. Um, and traditionally, you know, mavens aren't always the earliest adopters, but are probably the kind of people that you want to you know, attract to these curation markets. Um, so, how could you? kind of lower the barrier of entry for people who find out about it late, but are the you know, ideal person mm. for this curation. Yeah, so yeah, that's a good question. The, the, the goal is, is that if people think they are a good curator for a specific topic, they, they will find it somehow, but it's not necessarily the case. One of the things that, is, that I want to do with this thing is, this goes a bit more meta, is to have a curation market for curation markets. Yes. Right. So it's like, Community yeah. Turtles on the way down, kind of thing. 
uh, which would allow it to surface these things before in the right times. So you can find them before, if you think it's going to get big, then you can join in early and be rewarded proportionally for doing good curation. Um, but one of the reasons why I, I like this, this, the continuous token model where the community grows and shrinks over time is that it does allow people to get in without having to buy this token from someone else. Right? So if you think this price is reasonable, you can just get in. You don't go, you have to go to an exchange to buy this token, right? So, which, which I like, it allows, it allows more people to get in. Um, and so you can get in and get out simply through buying and selling from the smart contract, right? So um, in that way, we don't have to rely so much on external infrastructure to, to, to do this. Um, but it is an open question, and that's where the cost curves stuff come in. Maybe there's a different curve, because currently the curve is just goes like, it's linear for the most part, and then it goes eventually exponential. And that, the exponential end of the, the thing at the end was mostly from my master's research that I did, which was around like uh, uh, if you add if you add another person to a conversation, the amount of conversations increase by the amount of people in the room. So it's sort of you have to curtail it at some point. Um, but maybe there's better curves. Like maybe maybe it should go like this, and then you know be more open later on. I don't know. So we'll see. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, so, like, this was a lot of very good information. Uh, I think I got most of it, um, but uh, I probably will, hopefully will get most more of it after I get to read some of this paper. But one of us, how does this relate to the, some of the other projects that are out in the space? So, for example, Steemit, mm. that, the mm. old similar concepts, yes. which I understand, but I'm not that yeah. familiar with. So, yeah. yeah. So, there are there are different projects in the space that are trying to tackle this from different areas. Um, it's, it's sort of, uh, one way to describe it is like the attention economy, which is like trying to figure out how to make money from just the effort you put in from your attention. Um, so basic attention token is one where it's like reassessing the, the, the way the, the relationship between the advertiser and the user and the publisher works, um, which I think is cool, uh, cool experiment. Um, and then um, Steemit is sort of, it is Steemit has very similar prospects to this or ideas, um, and the cool thing about Steemit is they've had their protocol in the wild for a while, so they've had opportunity to test some of these assumptions already, which is awesome. Uh, but the thing to me about Steemit that's also been interesting is there's this concept of like I do things in Steemit so that I can get people to come back in and, and stay in this feedback loop or attract new people in this feedback loop, but it brings up the question about like. You need to get people in to understand what Steemit is. And so it's like, you, you kind of get the question of like, who are the people of Steemit? Because these are the people that I want to be, be belong to, right? What is that? And so it's sort of saying, the, that community does develop over time, but it's like saying, you know, who are the people of Reddit? You get the stereotype of what a Redditor is in the same way there would be a stereotype of what a Steemit user is. And so like, I feel like you can go a lot more granular than just like a platform level architecture to get people into some feedback loop like that. Um, so that's why it's topic based, not sort of platform based protocols. That the other thing here that I focus on as well is um, actually Ned from Steemit told me that he's working on similar things on Steemit uh, where different topics could have tokens as well um, instead of just being this one platform token. But uh, he, he said like he wants to do things where people can, can sell these tokens. But a lot of these creation market ideas for me is about thinking about the real bottom layer about how these tokens are created. Because at any point in time where you have to, to get to a point where someone is selling some of these tokens, you have to call a lawyer. You have to go through months of due diligence to figure out if this is a bug board or not. So I want these tokens to be created without there being centralized parties, right? That's why Bitcoin and Ethereum is like that in itself. There's no Bitcoin company giving the, the coins to someone. So that was one of the goals to make sure we can mint these things and people agree that it's fair, right? If, if it's a fair minting process, essentially. Yeah. Uh, I have a two questions that I made. Uh, one is probably very simple for you to answer. What are the features? of a group um, uh, to have uh, tokens for itself. So not all groups use tokens. Mm. So what, when when comes the point that they do actually need a token mm. to exchange stuff? Yeah. And the second is more to the uh, curation markets uh, part. 
Um, as far as I got you, if I got you right, you are trying to form groups that are curating more information. Mm -hmm. And as with the ETH trader, um, they will come to a point where, with, you know, they have a psychological group bias, mm -hmm. and um, you know, they will probably find information and do research that um, is um, speaking to the. Um, greatness of ether and, and that they, um, you know, it could be right, it could be wrong, mm. but there's there's bias in the group. Yeah. Um, and probably also with a lot of the curation markets mm. groups. Yeah, so the third question... Could you uh, repeat the question? So, so, so the first question was about, like, when, if, if we imagine that there's a bunch of groups that would use these things, when do they need a token, right? And the second question is the sort of, like, the, the, the concept of around these groups having psychological bias towards certain information and not necessarily objectively creating the best information. Is that correct? Yeah. So the first question is, when would when would these groups have tokens? Um, that that's an open-ended question. Um, my my gut feels that if there's, I, I want this thing to exist for a very long tail of things, right? So if there's any problem in coordination and we think that injecting these tokens in it, this sort of um, use stress response to coordination, we will hopefully see better coordination. But like how deep that goes, I'm not sure. Um, it might mean that it, it limits itself to a certain size, and it doesn't make sense to mint a token for this chair right here. Right? Well, I don't want to coordinate around who gets to sit in the chair. Right? It's pointless. Uh, but maybe machines want to do more coordination on a subhuman level, like we have high frequency trading. No, no human can trade there, but maybe there's ways for machines to coordinate on things like this. So maybe there is reasons to go much, 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 much lower. And the concept of psychological bias, um, I, I don't necessarily think that the, the point is to necessarily create the best information, it's to create information that's relevant for the group, right? Or like the, that would attract attention. And so, um, you still have the concept where news media sites is like the old, the old fake news thing. It's like, uh, Marshall Pinsky said it well. He said, it doesn't matter if the news is fake, but the, if the attention is real, right? So these groups might actually end up doing things like, uh, you know, doing the weirdest, craziest things because that attracts the most attention. And that's why Dogecoin became so popular because they started doing even weirder stuff. They started, they started sponsoring bobsled teams, right? To attract attention to their their currency, so it could create like weird sense of like tokenized tribalism, digital tribalism, that it in some extent worries me a bit as well. But um, I think in general, hopefully, it creates a lot of value that most people will be useful from it. I think um, that's good. Yeah. Just if there's one more question, and then I think we can have some peers. Uh, I think you already asked a question. Yeah. Uh, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, I guess we'll see if this one is the last question. Uh, do you see a lot of value in multiple competing curation markets? Or if there's one that really saturates the entire market, does that suffice? Mm. I love that because I wanted that's it, originally the, the previous iteration had like a global namespace, right? Which is like to allow people to get to coordinate better. It's like there's only one Ethereum curation market, for example. But I think it's too early. I think it's too early to say this is the best cost curves, this is the best implementation. I want there to exist competing curation markets, both in like trying different permutations, but even different curation markets with the same protocols competing against each other. You know, it will be sort of the survival of the fittest, uh, fittest attention. Um, and I think that will be more interesting. And that's why the, the concept of eventually having once you battle tested a bunch of the stuff to have a curation market, four curation markets to find these best ones and have them compete against each other. Because it could be at some point uh, where one, like let's say we create one where we want to get Vitalik Buterin's attention and Vitalik's not paying attention to it, he's not looking at it and suddenly he goes like, that's a good idea that this community generated and suddenly everyone's going to start rushing into that one and not another one because that one didn't succeed in getting attention or good curation. So I think there's going to be sort of this weird or like organic curation markets fighting against each other kind of thing, uh, which should, should be interesting. Hopefully, uh, people don't use too much money. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, get some beer.